morning, Word of Life family. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our walk through the book of Proverbs. We're on our second lap through the book of Proverbs in these morning sessions. Uh, yesterday, uh, Brother Juan was covering chapter 7. So this morning, we'll take a look at chapter 8. Now, this is day 62 of these morning sessions. And uh, Pastor Haynes covered chapter 8 in uh, day 31. So we're exactly 31 days later, 31 chapters of Proverbs, and we're back in chapter 8 again. Now, when uh, Pastor Haynes was going through chapter 8, he went through pretty close to the first 10 verses, and I'm going to uh, do pretty much the same thing, uh, but I'm going to take a slightly different uh, spin on it. Uh, there is more to find in the Word of God uh, than we can than any one person could ever discover in a lifetime, and uh, you can take millions of people in millions of lifetimes, and you still cannot cannot exhaust what is for us in the Word of God. Let's open with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we just thank you for your word, and we thank you for your spirit that inspired the writing of the word and lives within us to interpret the word to us and turn this logos, the written word, into a rhema, a living word within us, which can transform us to make us more like Jesus. And we ask that you do that with your word this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. So chapter eight is wisdom. And uh, eight verse one says, I'm, I'm reading from uh, the Amplified Bible. I will also use uh, some scriptures from the New American Standard translation. As we go through this, uh, translations are not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, but uh, each time you use a different translation, you find uh, something more that you can that that the the Lord can can work with, in in the way that the phraseology works and the word a, the actual words used uh, that lead you deeper in, into the things of the Spirit. So this is from uh, we'll start out uh, in the Amplified Bible, uh, chapter eight, verse one. Does not skillful and godly wisdom cry out? and understanding raise her voice. I'm going to skip down to verse 8, and uh, this is wisdom speaking. All the words of my mouth are righteous, upright, and right, and in right standing with God. There is nothing contrary to truth or crooked in them. They are all plain to him who understands and opens his heart, and right to those who find knowledge and live by it. Receive my instruction in preference to striving for silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. So we're tying wisdom, understanding, and knowledge together here. And the question I'm going to ask this morning is what is wisdom? Because we think of wisdom in uh, more earthly terms. I looked it up in the dictionary, and I thought about reading it to you, but uh, you already have a concept of what you think wisdom is in your mind. And um, I use a little phrase uh, from The Princess Bride. Uh, one of the characters kept saying inconceivable every time something happened that he didn't think should be happening. And another character turns to him at one point, and he says, you keep using this word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And, uh, and I think sometimes, well, I, I know that if you read the word wisdom in the Bible and you think of it as you learned it as you were growing up, uh, you don't understand what godly wisdom is. And that's uh, in verse 11, which we didn't get to. The very first phrase in that is, for skillful and godly wisdom is better than rubies or pearls and all the things that may desire that are not to be compared to it. Um, and, and here, uh, the Holy Spirit through Solomon is saying that wisdom and understanding and knowledge are tied together. 
if you go back to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, in the New American Standard, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So whatever wisdom is, is rooted and based in the fear of the Lord. Paul referred to it in Romans as a sense of reverence and the sense of majesty in God, the universe, and your fellow man. Proverbs 8.13 says, The reverent fear and worshipful awe of the Lord includes the hatred of evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and perverted and twisted speech I hate. If you go to uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, it says, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among the brothers. The first one, haughty eyes. That means a proud look. When you look down, when you look down your nose at a single other human being, you earn God as an enemy. That's, that's a tough thought. In Proverbs uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 14, it says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, Come to us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol. Even whole is those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us and we shall all have one purse. So, you know, these days people come up with all kinds of get, get rich schemes, uh, and, um, and a great many of them have to do with fleecing uh, unsuspecting and innocent people. Uh, there are so many uh, things going on on the internet, so many scams that are being run on the internet, and it's all to find people who are naive and you entice them with something they think they want and you get them, they get you to uh, commit money to them and, and they never deliver what they say they're going to deliver. There, uh, there's, there, there are just millions of these things going around and it's all people trying to take advantage of other people. And that means that they think you're not very bright you're naive and you can be taken. You're innocent and naive. And there are so many people who want to take advantage of people who are innocent and naive. Immanuel Kant said, never treat another human being as a means to your ends, but always eminently as ends worthy in themselves. When Paul says in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, let every man think of the other man as better than himself. The reasons are pretty simple. It's a, it's a psychological thing where if you don't think of yourself as better than the other person, or you even think of the other person as being better than you, it changes the way you behave towards them. If you think you're better than them or that they are, for some reason, a lesser person than you, it changes the way that you think about them. And if you continue in that thought process, you will use them and eventually abuse them. I'm going to uh, change gears just ever so slightly here and go to the book of Romans to make a point. In Romans chapter 3, verse 11, 
The Apostle Paul says something that is so obviously untrue that if you weren't trained to accept it, you'd never accept it. If you weren't trained to it as a Christian, you'd never accept this as being true. But Paul said in chapter 3, verse 11, there is none who seeks after God. And you think, well, that can't, no, that can't be true. There, there are thousands. Of, I mean, I'm a seeker after God. There are thousands of people, millions of people uh, throughout all of history who have sought after God. They've built uh, cathedrals. They've conquered countries uh, to, to supposedly to spread the gospel. Uh, they, they've sacrificed everything that they have. They've crawled on their hands and knees to do penance. Certainly these people were seeking after God. How can Paul uh, say that there is none who seeks after God. So you go on, that's verse 11, you go to verse 12, and go through from 12 through 18. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And it's that last phrase that is why he could say what he said back in verse 11. There is no fear of God before their, their eyes. What did we start with? Um, when we were one of the very first scriptures we looked at was Proverbs 1.7. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. In James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, but if any of you lacks wisdom, which is what we're asking, what is wisdom? Let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So it's promised to you. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So if you want to know God's ways, you want to know his truth, if you're going to have it, you must obey it, or it will destroy you. If you doubt in your heart that what he told you to do and then you do not do it, you will not receive God's blessing. You will not receive God's answers. You will be unstable in all your ways. In James chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, who among you is wise and in understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. You see that that's very similar to what we looked at in Proverbs. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's earthly. It's natural. It's demonic. King James says earthly, demonic, and sensual. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. Pure means there's no manipulation in it, no handling of other personalities for personal gain. You have to maintain your integrity and purity in your relationships with each other. Peaceable means peacemakers. Gentle means, think about this, if I treat you curtly, if I cut you off, it proves I don't love you very much. Without hypocrisy, you treat all men as worthwhile. You don't treat some preferentially, for if you prefer rich or poor, Smart or uneducated, you've violated the royal law of love. Let me change pages here. I am using some notes. 
There's no high or low in the kingdom of God. Everyone is worthy of your finest endeavor. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus speaking, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man. So, biblical wisdom, what is it? Wisdom is the God-given art of creative, exciting, adventurous, thrilling, just, honest, truthful, loving, kind, compassionate, tender, good, forgiving, forbearing, interpersonal relationships. Maybe wisdom wasn't what you thought it was. The next time you look at another person, think about it as if you're looking at God himself. Maybe try to get the perspective that God has. A lot of the failings that we have as we go through life are because we lack faith or the desire to practice our faith, but because we're not properly relating ourselves to the other children of God that we cohabitate this planet with. God bless you and keep you as you go through your day. And think about what God thinks wisdom is. Thank you.